Welcome back. The title of this mini lecture is The Great Migration. And we're going to talk about five terms that as you read more about the Great Migration, um, you know, it's good uh, to key in on these terms as a way to learn more about uh, what is a, a complex time uh, with really quite a lot at stake. So let's get into it. All right. The first term for us is terms, defining our terms or which one. So there's been a lot in the last couple of years, uh, work, a lot of work uh, from a number of historians uh, attempting to deconstruct and understand the complexities of the Great Migration. Uh, from James Grossman's uh, work at this in the 1980s, but more recently, some of the powerful works, right, like Isabel Wilkerson's Warmth of Other Sons, uh, and, and again, and again, many others. Uh, and I think that if folks are, are at least moderately familiar with the concept of the Great Migration, they often put this within the context of the 19-teens uh, or the 1920s, which, you know, this is kind of that classical period. Uh, that we tend to think of with the Great Migration. Uh, but scholars, for the most part, these days, uh, identify around three uh, migrations, uh, large-scale migrations, uh, from the American South, uh, either sort of up to the, the Midwest uh, or the North, uh, in the arc of the 20th century uh, for, for many black Americans. And so when we think about the Great Migration, it's important for us to define sort of which one. Uh, and for our purposes here, uh, for this video, we'll be talking a little bit about, this lecture we'll be talking a little bit about uh, sort of that classical uh, sort of central one uh, in the 1900s through the, you know, the 1920s. All right, uh, that brings us to our second term, which is Jim Crow and sharecropping. The motivating factors for black Americans to leave uh, the American South uh, varied, right? So you have usually, when it comes to the history of immigration or migration, what are often called push-pull factors. And this comes from an historian named Bernard Baylin, who studied stuff back in the 1950s and other things. What Baylin kind of thought was that there's things that are going to make somebody want to leave a place. There's going to be stuff that draws somebody into a place. And so if you're thinking about sort of where uh, black Americans are going to be going uh, in the 19-teens and 20s, so let's say uh, Chicago or to Detroit or to Harlem, right? Obviously, there's going to be things about the communities that existed there that are going to be attractive to them. There's also going to be things in the South uh, that contribute directly to them wanting to leave the South. Uh, you know, examples of those kinds of things are going to be things like Jim Crow. So Jim Crow, of course, was uh, the, the institutional system of legal segregation and discrimination that existed uh, at the federal, state, and local level not only across the American South uh, in the first half of the 19, uh, 1900s, uh, but also was legal nationally, right? So the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court case uh, had articulated the concept of separate but equal, uh, and which meant functionally uh, that if communities wanted to create segregated spaces uh, nationally, they certainly could do that. Uh, so, of course, you have the pervasive discrimination then that African Americans experience uh, on there, you know, the role of violence certainly there and the role of lynching uh, and in the sort of enforcement and maintenance of Jim Crow on the part of, of white individuals. Now, sharecropping is a part of that, uh, you know, kind of fits into this as well. So for many black Americans, you have these, these legal restrictions in terms of kinds of employment uh, that many of them can pursue. Uh, and so the concept of sharecropping, which uh, grew in popularity or in use, at least in the aftermath of the Civil War, whereby black Americans would have a, an opportunity to rent, uh, essentially, uh, land in some cases on former plantations where they were enslaved with the understanding being that at the end of the year and after the crops come in and after whatever profits are gone that they might be able to, to, to make a salary or make a, a living based on, based on that. Now, that was a system and a concept that affected both black and white Americans uh, in the second half of the 19th century and throughout the first half of the 20th. 
The difficulty, of course, was is that in many of these areas where cotton used to dominate and be king, uh, you see, of course, these great cyclical depressions that set in in the 1870s, the 1880s, the 1890s especially, uh, so that especially for many black Americans, they're going to find difficulty uh, getting loans, having credit, uh, and being able to get out of, uh, get out of impoverishment here. Uh, so you have both institutional discrimination, systematic racial violence, along with uh, institutional and enforced poverty, uh, which create, you know, a, a very, 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 very difficult uh, communal reality facing many black Americans, uh, and they decide to, to, to leave. Uh, the third term for us is the boll weevil. Uh, now, this particular beetle, this bug, uh, caused a number of infestations uh, in crops across the South uh, in some of the first years of the early 1900s. So just doubling down on that idea that sharecropping and sort of cyclical sort of impoverishment and the role the environment can play, uh, especially in, in farming if there's no, uh, you know, federal or state assistance, right? So that's going to play a role too. Uh, this brings us to our, our fourth point, uh, which is the Chicago Defender. Now, there were a number of, of prominent uh, black newspapers uh, in in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, so I'm thinking of the Pittsburgh Courier as an example as well. But the Chicago Defender in particular uh, was cited as a really important space uh, for communicating information uh, about the black community that existed in Chicago in the early 1900s, what was termed a, a black metropolis on the south side of the city. Uh, and so the Defender would be carried southward. Uh, it would often, uh, with, with Pullman porters and the role of the train lines, uh, be read widely uh, in the part of some black communities there uh, and actively encouraged uh, many black Americans uh, to take advantage of the uh, community institutions uh, to head northward uh, and to try to find jobs. So, you know, a train route eventually, say, from New Orleans to Memphis uh, is, you know, and then eventually to Chicago uh, is going to be something that, that is possible for, for many. Uh, the difficulty, of course, though, was that for those who wish to enforce or reinforce kind of the, the racial status quo and white supremacy, uh, Outlets like the Chicago Defender would then be viewed as a threat, and so there'd be, of course, you know, chances or ways or attempts to try to kind of stamp out its being, uh, being distributed kind of in this way. That brings us to our fifth point, uh, which is what's called the Urban League, okay, the Urban League. Now, the National Urban League is founded around 1910, uh, and one of the big things that the Urban League is going to do uh, is to try to assist many African Americans uh, as they're traveling to cities like New York or Chicago uh, in being able to find housing uh, and job assistance uh, and uh, providing a sort of, uh, you know, kind of institutional aid uh, as they sort of settle and acclimate uh, into, uh, into these communities. Thank you so very much.